welcome to another episode of Artist Spotlight, the podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Stringer, and this time we have a really, really unique up-and-coming photographer, Alyssa Howell, that I've come to know over about the last year or so through my shooting of Major League Baseball, and I can tell you that Alyssa has a phenomenal eye. She's new in the business. She has uh, concert clients where she's going all over the United States shooting music concerts. And she is really, really remarkable. It's uh, it's really great to see her work. And you can do so if you go on Instagram at ammedia underscore LLC or just look up Alyssa Howell. And she really is something else. She's also uh, someone you can look up on LinkedIn. But I really enjoyed this conversation that we had prior to both photographing a Baltimore Orioles home game and she really you know kind of explains her beginnings and where she's at now and the future is incredibly bright for her so I hope you relax sit back and enjoy this conversation with myself and Alyssa Howell as always the podcast is brought to you by your friends at the Maryland Photography Alliance take a look at what they have going on at mdphotoalliance.org We've got contests going on, lots of speakers happening, and you really don't want to miss it to stay abreast of everything photography that's going on. So without further ado, my talk with Alyssa Howell. We've got a very special guest today on the podcast. Joining me is professional baseball and concert photographer Alyssa Howell. Alyssa, thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. You know, when I met Alyssa, she and I were both photographing the Baltimore Orioles at Camden Yards, and just looking at some of her work, what was so impressive is that not only does she work for Major League Baseball as a content creator, but she also works across the country photographing live music, and, you know, such different genres, although baseball is in a stadium, football's in a stadium, and many concerts are in a stadium, but Alyssa, how would you describe just at, at a high level the difference between your work shooting sports and shooting live uh, musical performance so it's definitely different um obviously because you know one's more action one's more kind of just placed in front of you um trying to I, I like I, I guess you're asking the difference between the two right how, yeah. how I go back and forth between or like adapting to different surroundings yeah so you know for example when we're shooting a baseball mm -hmm. game we know who the star players are yes correct. we we know that the bases are loaded and there's two outs and it's high tension you know when you're shooting a concert and it's a taylor swift show or it's a whoever you know that he or she or the band they're the performer and unless you shoot them regularly, you know, understanding those big moments where they have the pyrotechnics or whatever it is, you know, I guess it's probably a different mindset that when you walk into an arena to shoot a football game or you walk into an arena to shoot a concert, there's probably a different thought process or maybe it's similar. How would you describe that? Yeah, it's definitely so in some ways it's very similar, but then some ways it's not. I honestly look at YouTube videos for a concert 99% um, of the time. That's how I study. Because like, if you think about it, most major performers do the same stuff every single night. And, you know, people these days film everything on their phones. So if you watch YouTube videos, that's how you can easily predict what will happen. And, like, with sports, you can't really necessarily predict what's going to happen. But as far as, like, concerts, I think, from my eyes, it's a little bit easier to adapt um, just because you have all those fans that get that content for you um, that pretty much shows you, oh, uh, what's going to happen. So that's how, me personally, that's how I do it, and that's how I kind of adapt to either or. But if you have such a passion for each two, you make it work. Yeah, and, and I can I can relate to that because when I'm shooting in a country that I've not been to before, mm -hmm. and I'm going to a specific uh, 
part of Africa, let's say, and I'm curious about what's the topography like, you know, is it mountainous, is it a forest kind of environment? I do the same thing. I'm on YouTube because it's it's such an incredible resource. So, you know, everyone's origin story is always interesting because we all get to where we are today through different paths. How did you get started? When did you pick up a camera for the first time? I was, I think, 17 or 18. I just was like a year and a half out of high school and I met a friend um, actually attending a concert. This was back when I was a fan um, of attending concerts, um, per se. Um, she had a camera and I asked her, I was like, oh, well, do you photograph bands or like, how, like, how do you bring a camera into a concert? So she told me, oh, I get press credentials and all that. And I never knew. I've always had a passion for photography, but I never knew I could put two different worlds within one. Um, so I was like, you know, asking her questions and I asked her if I can like shadow her one day just like not shadows like as a photographer but like she did interviews with bands too so she brought me on just to literally press a, the record start and stop button and one day I asked her um this is like just like a long story short I asked her I was like can I get a camera and try to shoot a show one day and she said go for it and I was just turned 18 and my parents were very hesitant about um me opening up a credit card because you know the credit cards are dangerous things sometimes um i did want i opened up a credit card at best buy and the rest was history i bought the cheapest camera i could i was only approved for like 500 dollars, so i got like a t3i and my first show was the fallout boy paramore show um by accident i was only approved for the opening band and there's a miscommunication between security and the in the tour and the security told, oh, yeah, you can shoot all bands. Now, mind you, Paramore, Fall Out Boy are, like, national bands. Like, well, worldwide bands. And, um, you know, it's... I never knew. This was my first show. I didn't know what I was doing. I barely even knew how to press the button, I guess. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, there's a mishap with the security and the bands and stuff. And, um, at the end of the little miscommunication, they let us shoot Fall Out Boy. So that was, like, my first show. And, I mean, I actually pulled up the pictures recently, and I was, like, really embarrassed about my work. Um, but that was the first time I ever picked up a camera, and it just blossomed from there by networking and um, stuff like that. Just, I didn't give up. Like, I've had so, so many people um, tell me, this is not a career. This is not something, it's not, like, it's a hobby. That's what pre pretty much people would tell me and didn't really have that faith in me but um now here i am today well and, and yeah. your, your work is is really beautiful you know when you're shooting a concert or you're shooting a, a sporting event generally how many photos are you making at sports versus a concert wow um so i mean honestly it ranges so if it's like a concert now this is going to sound crazy uh i range from maybe 1400 to 2200 photos now that's just for a concert it, like a standard club show because a lot I, I don't know why but i feel like a lot of the times these days people don't really have the best light or they don't want to put the money into providing light and stuff like that and 95 percent of the times these smaller acts can't really afford to have the best lighting rigs so you know sometimes you just have to spray and pray as you know some people say i know that sounds very unprofessional but Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And if you can make a frame out of something, just do it, you know, no matter how much it takes. Now, with sports, I mean, it's different because, like, if you want to capture that right moment, sometimes you just have to adjust and, you know, spray. Um, I know, like I said, I know that's probably not the best way to look at it, but sometimes, you know, you can create an image within that spray and you just go for it. Yeah. It, isn't it funny how the longer we shoot, the pictures we loved when we first got started, we look back with more experienced eyes and we think, why did I not delete that, you know, years ago? But yet I think there's a certain beauty to not having deleted it mm -hmm. because you look back and you can appreciate how far your, your skills have gone. Actually, yeah, I just, um, World Photography Day was what, uh, I think August 19th. Um, I, you know, kind of go along with the flow. Um, people will post, oh, happy World Photography Day if you're a photographer. Um, I mean, not everybody, but most people do. And I was like, let me pull, go back to my archives and 
see what I can find. So I found the first baseball game I ever photographed was, uh, which was the Frederick Keys back in, I think, 2019. Um, or, yeah, I think it was 2019. And then I pulled the first concert photo from Fall Out Boy. And I posted it along with my two most recent concert p photos, which was Pink um, at Nationals Park. And then a picture of Garrett Cole of the New York Yankees uh, here in Baltimore. And just seeing the different photos are night and day. And like you said, I would have deleted that stuff right away if I ever got that. Like, it would be gone. <laughs> You know, so much emphasis, uh, whether it's online or it's in podcasts, is around gear. Mm -hmm. And there's oftentimes that, that uh, desire to get the next thing and the next thing and the next thing in terms of camera bodies and lenses and, and so forth. You know, from your perspective, what role does gear play in creating a really strong image? Um, you know, I mean, it does play a big part because, I mean, in my opinion... You don't need the next thing that comes out. Like you can't, you don't have to drop everything and go buy the next thing. Because if you're a true creative, you can make an image with any type of camera. And that's how I. I mean, obviously, that's how I feel about it. Just because, like I, I started off with a, the base camera, and when I had that for like two years, and I started getting better slowly as I progressed in this career, like this career path. Um, and the images were okay. I mean, I didn't have the best stuff. But now that I do have a little bit higher gear uh, than what I used to have, um, I mean, not to, you know, to my own horn, but I think I have a few good images where I was like, okay, like, I don't need the next best thing. Like, I don't shoot mirrorless right now. Like, I'm still on a DSLR, and everybody shoots mirrorless practically. And I just don't need the best gear to create an image because if I'm creative enough, I can make anything work. But you're not shooting film. No, I. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. When <laughs> okay, I say no, that. <laughs> but I mean, I would wouldn't mind dabbling into doing film because I've always I love film. Like I actually carry around um, what's it called the you know the disposable cameras. Okay, yeah, yeah. I yeah. do have a few of them that I like to buy in bulk when they're on sale. Yeah, my uh, my mother was famous for visiting me when I lived at different places around the country, and she would show up with three or four disposable cameras still in the box, just ready to open up and ready to shoot whatever, you know, wherever I was. Uh, and it was funny because once she came to visit, she didn't realize that all of the disposable cameras she bought were all panoramic pictures. So that was so we have these weird long pictures from her entire visit. So. But see, that makes it unique because like you don't ever like I have I have not developed any of them yet. I have about ten of them. I okay. just don't have the time to really sit there and go and get them developed. Um, but the beauty of having those is that you never know what you have. That, that's true. That's I mean, true. unless you really think about oh, what did I take on this, or you mark it down. But I. I'm pretty sure, like, having a disposable camera is, like, kind of fun. It's, like, kind of like an Easter egg hunt, you know, when you go and get the egg and... It's like a, like, oh it's a mystery box. Yeah, exactly. So, I think it's fun to have those, and I like carrying them around. So, as, as you were coming up, now, did you get... A, well, maybe it's a two-part question. Did you have any formal photography training, and did you have any photography mentors? Um, You know, when I was in high school, I took photography and I put massive air quotation marks around photography um I went to school in Frederick County and they didn't really teach you proper photography in those classes it was more so it's like oh do photoshop learn how to make a section of the image color and then the rest black and white they would give you like a little point and shoot camera so it was not DSLR it wasn't properly taught and um that's what kind of like stinks about it is um I never had the proper guidance, and I just picked it up and winged it, pretty much. Like, I just self-taught. I've never went to school for it, because, like I said, I wouldn't count teaching a Photoshop kind of class and calling it photography, photography. Um, but, no, I've never had any proper teachings. And, I, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily men have, say, mentors. I do have a lot of people... Uh, that I've actually met recently and who I've met over the couple years I've been doing this um, that have helped me a lot. Like, am I allowed to name drop? Or? Of course. Okay, so like, uh, I want to say definitely Jeff Burke, um, Tommy, 
um, Rob Carr, even like those people, Julio Rodriguez, like no, um, Julio Cortez. Yeah, Cortez. Sorry about that. About that. Um, so like stuff like that. Like these people have definitely guided me to be a, like make a better image. So I would say people like them um, have definitely helped me. But you know, it's just I wouldn't say it I've never locked into an actual mentor. Sure. Well, and and I was uh, I was talking to someone earlier about the generosity of the photography community in mm-hmm. terms of advice and input and and so forth. So when you go out to shoot, because I I know we're going to get the gear questions, so we may as well address this. When you're shooting sports, what is your typical kit? And when you're shooting concerts, what is your typical lens setup? So for sports, um, I actually just recently got a four hundred. 2.8 version 2 and I am in love with it. Like okay. I used to have the Sigma 120 to 300 that was very versatile um, honestly because you know you have you can zoom in and out. You can create tight shots or you can create a little bit wider shots. Um, but ever since getting that 400 it's been my main go to. I also carry a 70 to 200 on me and a 24 to 70 for those nice on deck wide shots because uh, at Camden Yards, um, I really like doing this thing. I, I probably have worn it out, but inside the inner wells, um, on both sides, well, more so on the visitor side, they have this netting in front on the sides of the wells. So I like to create images through that netting. So I kind of like, kind of makes it look cool, you know, having the warehouse in the background and stuff like that. Especially if you have like angry crowd, uh, clouds and stuff, um, it, it makes for a really cool image. So always have that 24 to 70. Um, for concerts, depending on the shoot, like a lot of the times, especially nowadays, post COVID, people are still making you shoot from the soundboard. Like there's a lot of artists that are soundboard now. They used to be from the pit. So if I'm in the soundboard, it's 70 to 200 and my 400. But if I'm in the photo pit, it's mainly my 24 to 70, but also a 70 to 200. It just depends on the um, venue. Cause some venues have really tall stages, and I'm very short. Well, and you know, in my in my time shooting a number of concerts, I, I've always been you know one of those who's restricted to you can only shoot the first three songs. Oh yeah, definitely. Are, are, are you finding that 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 standard still remains? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's sometimes actually it's one song I recently covered. I think it was Kenny Chesney last year, and it was like one song. So it's like. Yeah, you get that standard first three songs, but sometimes if you're lucky enough, you have a relationship with the artist. Um, there's been a couple of times where I've had full set, which is really nice to have, because then you can test how creative you can be. Yeah, no, that that yeah, you you have the the luxury of trying some things because you don't have to get as many key shots in that first song or exactly, that or that second exactly. song. So yeah. So now when you're when you've been shooting or even on the way to a shoot, what what's the what's the craziest thing you've seen either by fans or just photography experiences uh, while you're while you're shooting or going to shoot? Wow, that's um so are you talking about like rituals like what I do? Sure, before? sure. Okay, so I always listen to the artists that well not always, or I listen I have like a playlist of like my favorite songs that I listen to, to kind of get me in the zone. Um, so I do that or, but when I'm at the show and I can't obviously listen to my playlist, um, the, like fans are crazy. There are some fans out there that, uh, are really super dedicated to said artists that they see. So, um, yeah, it just, I mean, I won't go into detail cause there's so many people that I've seen where it's like, wow. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been in situations where I'm facing the stage, shooting who's ever there, and I've got, you know, fans who are pulling my hair, I've got, yep. you know, beer poured over me, you know. I uh, love country shows, too. <laughs> pe- people, you know, where the uh, where people are getting squashed up against the barricade and the security is bringing them over into that protected stage front area to mm-hmm. usher them out the side so they don't literally get killed. Yeah, exactly, and I've, you know... I will say a lot of the times now, um, people are a little bit more calm, um, but I would mean, once you get that music flowing, people go crazy. Like, it's, it's like something that, unfortunately, like, we have no control over, but it's just, at least there's passion there still for music. I know sometimes, we, people are weird nowadays, where it's like, 
it's not all about the music. It's about you know, either clout, how people get like really super excited, um, like seeing front row or whatever, buying like crazy expensive tickets or meeting the artist. It's not about the music really anymore. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I well, mean, yeah. It, it, I think th- things have become very much a, a look at me culture. Exactly. And and it, it's it's really taken away from the the performance that you're going to see, and it's well, and maybe part of that is social media, where I'm oh gonna, yeah for I, sure I'm going to sure. show myself getting dressed before the event, going to the event, walking into the event before the event. It almost becomes where the performer is like a sidelight to me and everything I'm doing exactly. going to the event. <laughs> and there's some photographers like that too. Like if you really think about it, if you look at it. When I first started shooting concerts, there was, like, maybe three, four photographers max. Now, I mean, and, like, I've made a lot of connections in the industry, and there's a lot of people. Like, I get denied for people that I've shot, like, five, six, seven times. And, but you see, like, you know, Joe Schmo over here doesn't have anyone backing him or whatever shooting the show. So, it's, like... Definitely, it's a me culture. That's what I refer to it as. There, there's always the, uh, you know, it, it's not what you know, but who you know. And exactly. Jockeying 100%. for position. So as we sit here talking today, we're at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, and you and I are both going to be shooting tonight's ball game. So I'm aware of this, but I don't think that listeners would be. You know, if you have a 7 o'clock game, maybe walk the listeners through when you arrive at the game what your process is leading up to the first pitch and then the game and then post game just so people kind of have an idea how long are you at a ballpark what are you doing besides literally just pushing a shutter at the right moments so typically if i'm working for mlb i get here around three and a half hours before first pitch just because you know they have stuff like pre-game stuff like batting practice um you know warm-ups you you know grab that type of content before a game um, in between time, I, you know, I just take a minute to take everything in, just, I guess, compress. Um, I'll edit some photos from past assignments and stuff like that. Um, that's like in between batting practice and then the actual game. And then usually what I do is like I study, um, the, like the rosters, like the lineups for this night, because let's just say it's a lefty righty, you know, it's always opposite batters. So depending on, Who's a, I mean, I hate to, like, call out just a star player, but, like, you know, let's take it for, like, it's the Blue Jays versus the Orioles. The Orioles have some star players, and so does the Blue Jays. And if you're on opposite, like, you know, let's just say, you know, it's two righties pitching tonight, I believe. Everybody's going to be batting left-handed. So I kind of want to be trying to find my position of where I want to be to start off the night to get those star players before, you know, I have to focus on something else. Um, so, you know, throughout the game, then I, you know, just make my images in different wells. Um, after the game, I export my photos. I usually send, I have to get out, like, the top 15 to 20 photos on unedited to, um, MLB to get those out. Um, and then post-game, I just edit the rest, and I wait 24 hours to post on social media. So, I mean, it's a long day, but... So aside from shooting because it's an assignment, what what are your favorite sports? My favorite sport, like to shoot or just in general? In general. Oh, in general. I am such a baseball nerd. Um, I love baseball. I, you know, grew up ever since I could pretty much walk a Yankees fan. So diehard Yankees fan. So I just like, I grew up with baseball in a baseball household. Um, I'm starting to really get into hockey, kind of. Um, it's just some, there's something different about it because it's not easy to shoot and I like a challenge yeah yeah hockey is really hard to shoot not only to keep track of where the puck is but if you're shooting right up against the glass yep, that make, little hole thing yeah, yeah. For, for those of you unfamiliar there are small lens size holes at certain spots generally on the corners uh, of the ovals and if your lens protrudes inside of the rink you can lose your lens so you you don't want to do that but you have relatively little left to right movement of your lens because the hole is only or the opening is only so big yeah, so and it, it's hard i shot my first hockey game last year well no it was this year but at the end of the season and it was definitely a challenge but i like a challenge so it's 
something I do am going to grow to like and hopefully succeed at. But then again, I also like football, too, because the action is just incredible. Yeah, shooting shooting ice hockey from above with a long lens mm-hmm. definitely can have its benefits. Oh, yeah, just, for sure. Just because you can, you can track things. Well, I can tell you that there's nothing more fun than sitting courtside under the basket shooting NBA basketball when the player makes a layup, keeps going, and then ends up in your lap. And that's that's <laughs> happened to me on more than a few occasions. I'm six foot tall and not particularly small, but when a guy is 6'9 or 6'10 mm-hmm. and he's on your lap it, it's it's not the way you want to meet them yeah no i wouldn't want that to happen to be honest with you <laughs> but i have yet to shoot court side for that so i would be honored to one day but i think i'm just going to stick to my uh up in the concourse type of uh action for a little bit <laughs> so for for those people who you know who are hobbyists and you know, they're photographing their child sports or their grandchild sports. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what, what kind of advice would you have for somebody who's in that situation and they want to photograph a soccer game, football game, basketball game? Are there a couple of keys that you would suggest for an amateur uh, to consider when they're going to go shoot that, that person's game in terms of angles or preparation or anything like that? So... From what I mean, from experience and from what I've been told, um, you know, because like I'm only a year and a half ish into shooting professional sports, um, so my advice is know your settings um, because that's like key. Because you know you have to know your settings in order. I mean, it's a given, uh, and always shoot low because it tells a better story, especially you know at a soccer game or at especially football. They always say shoot low because it makes for better angles. Yeah, and and just to be clear, Alyssa's talking about you as the photographer getting low, whether you're taking a knee or, or you're sitting with your legs crossed or you're sitting with or you have both knees down, but get physically low because then it's more of, a, of an eye level and you're not shooting kind of down on something. Yeah, and it makes you... I mean, luckily for me, I'm short, so I don't have to get too, too low, but... Um, yeah, definitely get low so you can get those angles and make the player look... I mean, obviously they are bigger than most people, but it makes them look like, you know, they're going to, I guess, topple over you and kind of, you know, kind of thing. So always, you know, always shoot low. That's what I've been told. <laughs> well, you know, your work is really incredibly impressive. For, for our listeners who want to see what Alyssa Howell is all about, what, what are good ways for them to follow you or see what you're doing photographically? Um, so I'm really, I mean, I'm okay with social media. I mean, I do post a lot on Instagram. So it's uh, AM Media underscore LLC is my Instagram. I'm not the best at keeping track on Facebook uh, and stuff like that. So Instagram is definitely where you'll find me. And, and we'll put that in the show notes so Perfect. that so that everybody Perfect. has access. And, you know, it's it's a pleasure to be able to interview someone who is early on in their career. But I can tell you from doing this for more years than I care to remember because I'm getting older and I can't remember <laughs> all of them. Uh, it's really great to see someone's work who you see it and you realize this. She's got an eye for this and she's doing it more than just an eye. She's making it happen. Her work is really creative, really something special. So I encourage all the listeners to to check it out. So Alyssa, thank you so much for thank taking you. the time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. I hope you enjoyed my talk with Alyssa Howell. We, we definitely covered some ground. Hopefully that gave you some background on her work and some things to look forward to from her in the future. Hopefully you'll give her a follow and, and pay attention as her career continues to evolve even further. Additionally, we hope that you will subscribe and like the podcast. That helps us get the word out there. You can send that information to other fellow photographers and people that you think would appreciate the conversations, the interviews, and the insights. So a uh, great way to, to get the word out. So until next time, Mitch Stringer here saying, I wish you good light, happy shooting, and we'll see you next time.